Welcome back. It is chapter five of A Wrinkle in Time. This chapter is called The Tesseract. Yes, Mrs. Witch said, he is behind the darkness so that even we cannot see him. Meg began to cry, to sob aloud. Through her tears, she could see Charles Wallace standing there, very small, very white. Calvin put his arms around her, but she shuddered and broke away, sobbing wildly. Then she was enfolded in the great wings of Mrs. Wetzit, and she felt comfort and strength pouring through her. Mrs. Wetzit was not speaking aloud, and yet through the wings, Meg understood words. My child, do not despair. Do you think we would have brought you here if there were no hope? We are asking you to do a difficult thing, but we are confident that you can do it. Your father needs help. He needs courage. And for his children, he may be able to do what he cannot do for himself. Now, Mrs. Witch said, are we ready? Where are we going? Calvin asked. Again, Meg felt an actual physical tingling of fear as Mrs. Witch spoke. We must go behind the shadow. But we will not do it all at once, Mrs. Wetzik comforted them. We will do it in short stages. She looked at Meg. Now, we will test her. We will wrinkle again. Do you understand? No, Meg said flatly. Mrs. Wetzik sighed. Explanations are not easy when they are about things for which your civilization still has no words. Calvin talked about traveling at the speed of light. You understand that, little Meg? Yes, Meg nodded. That, of course, is the impractical long way around. We have learned to take shortcuts wherever possible. Sort of like in math, Meg asked. Like in math. Mrs. Wetzit looked over at Mrs. Who. Take your skirt and show them. La experiencia es la madre de la ciencia. Spanish, my dears. Cervantes. Experience is the mother of knowledge. Mrs. Who took a portion of her white robe in her hands and held it tight. You see, Mrs. Wetzit said, if a very small insect were to move from the section of skirt in Mrs. Who's right hand to that in her left, it would be quite a long walk for him if he had to walk straight across. Swiftly, Mrs. Who brought her hands still holding the skirt together. Now you see, Mrs. Wetzit said, he would be there without that long trip. That is how we travel. Charles Wallace accepted the explanation serenely. Even Calvin did not seem perturbed. Oh dear, Meg sighed, I guess I am a moron. I just don't get it. That is because you think of space only in three dimensions, Mrs. Wetzit told her. We travel in the fifth dimension. This is something you can understand, Meg. Don't be afraid to try. Was your mother able to explain a tesseract to you? Well, she never did, Meg said. She got so upset about it. Why, Mrs. Wetzit? She said it had something to do with her and father. It was a concept they were playing with, Mrs. Wetzit said, going beyond the fourth dimension to the fifth. Did your mother explain it to you, Charles? Well, yes, Charles looked a little embarrassed. Please don't be hurt, Meg. I just kept at her while you were at school till I got it out of her. Meg sighed. Just explain it to me. Okay, Charles said. What is the first dimension? Well, a line. Okay, and the second dimension? Well, you'd square the line. A flat square would be in the second dimension. And the third? Well, you'd square the second dimension then the square wouldn't be flat anymore. It would have a bottom and sides and a top. And the fourth? Well, I guess if you want to put it into mathematical terms, you'd square the square. But you can't take a pencil and draw it the way you can the first three. I know it's got something to do with Einstein and time. I guess maybe you could call the fourth dimension time. That's right, Charles said. Good girl. Okay, then. For the fifth dimension, you'd square the fourth, wouldn't you? I guess so. Well, the fifth dimension's a tesseract. You add that to the other four dimensions and you can travel through space without having to go the long way around. In other words, to put it into Euclid or old-fashioned plane geometry, 
a straight line is not the shortest distance between two points. For a brief illuminating second, Meg's face had the listening, probing expression that was so often seen on Charles's. I see, she cried, I got it. For just a moment, I got it. I can't possibly explain it now. But there for a second, I saw it. She turned excitedly to Calvin. Did you get it? He nodded. Enough. I don't understand it the way Charles Wallace does, but enough to get the idea. So now we go, Mrs. Witch said. There is not all the time in the world. Could we hold hands, Meg asked. Calvin took her hand and held it tightly in his. You can try, Mrs. Wessett said, though I'm not sure how it will work. You see, though we travel together, we travel alone. We will go first and take you afterward in the backwash. That may be easier for you. As she spoke, the great white body began to waver, the wings to dissolve into mist. Mrs. Who seemed to evaporate until there was nothing but the glasses, and then the glasses too disappeared. It reminded Meg of the Cheshire cat. I've often seen a face without glasses, she thought, but glasses without a face? I wonder if I go that way too, first me and then my glasses? She looked over at Mrs. Witch. Mrs. Witch was there, and then she wasn't. There was a gust of wind and a great thrust and a sharp shattering as she was shoved through what? Then darkness, silence, nothingness? If Calvin was still holding her hand, she could not feel it. But this time she was prepared for the sudden and complete dissolution of her body. When she felt the tingling coming back to her fingertips, she knew that this journey was almost over and she could feel again the pressure of Calvin's hand about hers. Without warning, coming as a complete and unexpected shock, she felt a pressure she had never imagined as though she were being completely flattened out by an enormous steam roller. This was far worse than the nothingness had been. While she was nothing, there was no need to breathe, but now her lungs were squeezed together so that although she was dying for want of air, there was no way for her lungs to expand and contract, to take in the air that she must have to stay alive. This was completely different from the thinning of atmosphere when they flew up the mountain and she had had to put the flowers to her face to breathe? She tried to gasp, but a paper doll can't gasp. She thought she was trying to think, but her flattened out mind was as unable to function as her lungs. Her thoughts were squashed along with the rest of her. Her heart tried to beat. It gave a knife-like sideways movement, but it could not expand. But then she seemed to hear a voice or if not a voice, at least words, words flattened out like printed words on paper. Oh no, we can't stop here. This is a two-dimensional planet and the children can't manage here. She was whizzed into nothingness again and nothingness was wonderful. She did not mind that she could not feel Calvin's hand, that she could not see or feel or be. The relief from the intolerable pressure was all she needed. Then the tingling began to come back to her fingers, her toes. She could feel Calvin holding her tightly. Her heart beat regularly, blood coursed through her veins. Whatever had happened, whatever mistake had been made, it was over now. She thought she heard Charles Wallace saying, his words round and full as spoken words ought to be, really, Mrs. Witch, you might have killed us. This time, she was pushed out of the frightening fifth dimension with a sudden, immediate jerk. There she was, herself again, standing with Calvin beside her, holding onto her hand for dear life, and Charles Wallace in front of her, looking indignant. Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Which were not visible, but she knew that they were there. The fact of their presence was strong about her. Children, I apologize, came Mrs. Witch's voice. Now, Charles, calm down, Mrs. What's It said appearing not as the great and beautiful beast she had been when they last saw her, but in her familiar wild garb of shawls and scarves and the old tramp's coat and hat. You know how difficult it is for her to materialize. If you are not substantial yourself, it's very difficult to realize how limiting protoplasm is. I am sorry, Mrs. Witch's voice came again, but there was more than a hint of amusement in it. It is not funny, Charles Wallace gave a childish stamp of his foot. 
Mrs. Hu's glasses shone out, and the rest of her appeared more slowly behind them. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, she smiled broadly. Prospero in the Tempest. I do like that play. You didn't do it on purpose, Charles demanded. Oh, my darling, of course not, Mrs. Watson said quickly. It was just a very understandable mistake. It's very difficult for Mrs. Witch to think in a corporeal way. She wouldn't hurt you deliberately, you know that. And it's really a very pleasant little planet and rather amusing to be flat. We always enjoy our visits there. Where are we now then, Charles Wallace demanded, and why? In Orion's belt. We have a friend here and we want you to have a look at your own planet. When are we going home, Meg asked anxiously. What about mother? What about the twins? They'll be terribly worried about us. When we didn't come in at bedtime, well, mother must be frantic by now. She and the twins and Fort will have been looking and looking for us. And of course we aren't there to be found. Now don't worry, my pet, Mrs. Wetzit said cheerfully. We took care of that before we left. Your mother has had enough to worry with her and you and Charles to cope with and not knowing about your father without our adding to her anxieties. We took a time wrinkle as well as a space wrinkle. It's very easy to do if you just know how. What do you mean? Meg asked plaintively. Please, Mrs. Wetzit, it's all so confusing. Just relax and don't worry over things that need it trouble you, Mrs. Wetzit said. We made a nice, tidy little time tesser. And unless something goes terribly wrong, we'll have you back about five minutes before you left. So there'll be time to spare and nobody will ever need to know you were gone at all. Though of course you'll be telling your mother, dear lamb, that she is. And if something goes terribly wrong, it won't matter whether we ever get back at all. Don't frighten them, Mrs. Witch's voice came. Are you losing faith? Oh, no, no, I'm not. But Meg thought her voice sounded a little faint. I hope this is a nice planet, Calvin said. We can't see much of it. Does it ever clear up? Meg looked around her, realizing that she had been so breathless from the journey and the stop on the two-dimensional planet that she had not noticed her surroundings. And perhaps this was not very surprising, for the main thing about the surroundings was exactly that they were unnoticeable. They seemed to be standing on some kind of nondescript flat surface. The air around them was gray. It was not exactly fog, but she could see nothing through it. Visibility was limited to the nicely definite bodies of Charles Wallace and Calvin, the rather unbelievable bodies of Mrs. Watson and Mrs. Who, and a faint occasional glimmer that was Mrs. Witch. Come children, Mrs. Watson said, we don't have far to go and we might as well walk. It will do you good to stretch your legs a little. As they moved through the grayness, Meg caught an occasional glimpse of slag-like rocks, but there were no traces of trees or bushes, nothing but flat ground under their feet, no sign of any vegetation at all. Finally, ahead of them, there loomed what seemed to be a hill of stone. As they approached it, Meg could see that there was an entrance that led into a deep, dark cavern. Are we going in there, she asked nervously. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Watson said. It's easier for the happy medium to work within. Oh, you'll like her children. She's very jolly. If ever I saw her looking unhappy, I would be very depressed myself. As long as she can laugh, I'm sure everything is going to come out right in the end. Mrs. Watson, came Mrs. Witch's voice severely. Just because you are very young is no excuse for talking too much. Mrs. Watson looked hurt, but she subsided. Just how old are you? Calvin asked her. Just a moment, Mrs. Watson murmured and appeared to calculate rapidly upon her fingers. She nodded triumphantly. Exactly 2,379,152,497 years, eight months, and three days. That is according to your calendar, of course, which even you know isn't very accurate. She leaned closer to Meg and Calvin and whispered, it was really a very great honor for me to be chosen for this mission. It's just because of my verbalizing and materializing so well, you know. But of course, we can't take any credit for our talents. It's how we use them that counts. And I make far too many mistakes. 
That's why Mrs. Who and I enjoyed seeing Mrs. Witch make a mistake when she tried to land you on a two-dimensional planet. It was that we were laughing at, not at you. She was laughing at herself, you see. She's really terribly nice to us younger ones. Meg was listening with such interest to what Mrs. Whatsit was saying that she hardly noticed when they went into the cave. The transition from the grayness of outside to the grayness of inside was almost unnoticeable. She saw a flickering light ahead of them, ahead and down, and it was toward this that they went. As they drew closer, she realized that it was a fire. It gets very cold in here, Mrs. Whatsit said, so we asked her to have a good bonfire going for you. As they approached the fire, they could see a dark shadow against it. And as they went closer still, they could see that the shadow was a woman. She wore a turban of beautiful pale mauve silk and a long flowing purple satin gown. In her hands was a crystal ball into which she was gazing raptly. She did not appear to see the children, Mrs. Whatsit, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch, but continued to stare into the crystal ball. And as she stared, she began to laugh and she laughed and laughed at whatever it was that she was seeing. Mrs. Witch's voice rang out clear and strong, echoing against the walls of the cavern, and the words fell with a sonorous clang. We are here, the woman looked up from the ball, and when she saw them, she got up and curtsied deeply. Mrs. Whatsit and Mrs. Who dropped small curtsies in return, and the shimmer seemed to bow slightly. Oh, medium dear, Mrs. Whatsit said. These are the children. Charles Wallace Murray. Charles Wallace bowed. Margaret Murray. Meg felt that if Mrs. Whatsit and Mrs. Who had curtsies, she ought to also. So she did rather awkwardly. And Calvin O'Keefe. Calvin bobbed his head. We want them to see their home planet, Mrs. Whatsit said. The medium lost the delighted smile she had worn till then. Oh, why must you make me look at unpleasant things when there are so many delightful ones to see? Again, Mrs. Witch's voice reverberated through the cave. There will no longer be so many pleasant things to look at if responsible people do not do something about the unpleasant ones. The medium sighed and held the ball high. Look, children, Mrs. Whatsit said, look into it well. Que la terra es petite, aquí la voix de su, de little. How small is the earth to him who looks from heaven, Mrs. Who intoned musically. Meg looked into the crystal ball, at first with caution, then with increasing eagerness, as she seemed to see an enormous sweep of dark and empty space, and then galaxies swinging across it. Finally, they seemed to move in closer on one of the galaxies. Your own Milky Way, Mrs. Whatsit whispered to Meg. They were headed directly toward the center of the galaxy. Then they moved off to one side. Stars seemed to be rushing at them. Meg flung her arm up over her face as though to ward off the blow. Look, Mrs. Witch commanded. Meg dropped her arm. They seemed to be moving in towards a planet. She thought she could make out polar ice caps. Everything seemed sparkling clear. No, no, medium dear, that's Mars, Mrs. Whatsit reproved gently. Do I have to, the medium asked. Now, Mrs. Witch commanded. The bright planet moved out of their vision. For a moment, there was the darkness of space, then another planet. The outlines of this planet were not clean and clear. It seemed to be covered with a smoky haze. Through the haze, Meg thought she could make out the familiar outlines of continents like pictures in her social studies books. Is it because of our atmosphere that we can't see properly? She asked anxiously. No, Meg, you know that it is not the atmosphere, Mrs. Witch said. You must be brave. It's the thing, Charles Wallace cried. It's the dark thing we saw from the mountain peak on Uriel when we were riding on Mrs. Whatsit's back. Did it just come? Meg asked in agony, unable to take her eyes from the sickness of the shadow which darkened the beauty of the earth. Did it just come while we've been gone? Mrs. Witch's voice seemed very tired. 
tell her, she said to Mrs. What's it. Mrs. What's it sighed. No, Meg, it hasn't just come. It has been there for a great many years. That is why your planet is such a troubled one. But why, Calvin started to ask, his voice croaking hoarsely. Mrs. What's it raised her hand to silence him. We showed you the dark thing on Uriel first. Oh, for many reasons. First, because the atmosphere on the mountain peaks there is so clear and thin, you could see it for what it is. And we thought that it would be easier for you to understand it if you saw it. Well, someplace else first, not your own Earth. I hate it, Charles Wallace cried passionately. I hate the dark thing. Mrs. What's it nodded. Yes, Charles, dear, we all do. That's another reason we wanted to prepare you on Uriel. We thought it would be too frightening for you to see it, first of all, about your own beloved world. But what is it? Calvin demanded. We know that it's evil, but what is it? You have said it, Mrs. Witch's voice rang out. It is evil. It is the powers of darkness. But what's going to happen? Meg's voice trembled. Oh, please, Mrs. Witch, tell us what's going to happen. We will continue to fight. Something in Mrs. Witch's voice made all three of the children stand straighter, throwing back their shoulders with determination, looking at the glimmer that was Mrs. Witch with pride and confidence. And we're not alone, you know, children, came Mrs. Watts at the comforter. All through the universe, it's been fought all through the cosmos, and my, but it's a grand and exciting battle. I know it's hard for you to understand about size, how there's very little difference in the size of the tiniest microbe and the greatest galaxy. You think about that, and maybe it won't seem strange to you that some of our very best fighters have come right from your own planet. And it's a little planet, dears, out on the edge of a little galaxy. You can be proud that it's done so well. Who have our fighters been, Calvin asked. Oh, you must know them, dear, Mrs. Watsit said. Mrs. Who's spectacles shone out at them triumphantly. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus, Charles Wallace said. Why, of course, Jesus. Of course, Mrs. Watsit said. Go on, Charles, love. There were others. All your great artists. There have been lights for us to see by. Leonardo da Vinci, Calvin suggested tentatively and Michelangelo, and Shakespeare, Charles Wallace called out, and Bach, and Pasteur, and Madame Curie, and Einstein. Now Calvin's voice rang with confidence. And Schweitzer, and Gandhi, and Buddha, and Beethoven, and Rembrandt, and St. Francis. Now you, Meg, Mrs. What's it ordered. Oh, Euclid, I suppose. Meg was in such an agony of impatience that her voice grated irritably. And Copernicus. And what about father? Please, what about father? We are going to your father, Mrs. Witch said. But where is he? Meg went over to Mrs. Witch and stamped as though she were as young as Charles Wallace. Mrs. Watts had answered in a voice that was low, but quite firm, on a planet that has given in. So you must prepare to be very strong. All traces of cheer had left the happy medium's face. She sat holding the great ball, looking down at the shadowed earth and a slow tear coursed down her cheek. I can't stand it any longer, she sobbed. Watch now, children, watch.